everybody. Welcome to another episode of Tech Done Different. As always, I'm your host, Ted Harrington. And with me here today is our special guest, Josh Nixon, the CTO of Prime Roots, the uh, meatless meat or meat alternative company. Uh, Josh, thank you so much for joining the show today. Yeah, thanks, Ted. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So here's where I want to start, because you and I were having a really interesting conversation the other day about, you know, mm -hmm. The word tech in, in the title of this show, of course. And we were talking about what tech even is. So I would like to hear your answer to that question. What is technology? Because so many of our listeners think about tech, myself included, in the context of software, um, code, things of that nature. And obviously that's not the only definition of tech. So in your worldview, what is tech? I think it's a really hard question to answer, right? Um, I think that the definition colloquially of what is tech, I agree, is currently very centered around software. And I think that has to do with where innovation is occurring and where the most rapid pace of change is occurring. Um, and I think that that evolves over time, right? If we go back to various periods in history, you could think about what would be considered technology be very different. Um, you know, there's a period before software where I think immediately prior, you know, I think of electricity and um, related appliances would probably be what we would most consider to be tech at that period. And then before that, there's a lot more on work on chemistry um, specifically. And then before that, immediately a lot of work on, you know, mechanical devices and engines, the very development of which. And, I think that, you know, we also think of tech very narrowly um, as something that's happened for the last 250 years. Um, and I think there's a reason for that. It's because that's when most of it has been developed. But um, there's also tech from before that. It just took a lot longer to come up with something because we didn't have as much to build off of. Um, and so like things that we um, utilize, you know, some of the technologies we utilize and build on top of are actually things that I would say are, you know, ancient technologies like fermentation, I think is a technology. And, um, you know, that's something that took a very long time to figure out and even longer to understand how it worked, which I think is fascinating. A lot of those ancient technologies, um, to me that actually separates technology and science because technology is useful, but you actually don't, to me, for it to be technology, it helps to know the science. But you don't have to know the science to have the technology. That's a really fascinating point that, well, there's so much of what you said that's really fascinating, but this idea that you don't necessarily need to know the science uh, because it what that makes me think of is this sort of misconception that happens, uh, you know, not just within tech and not just within software, but within security, there's this misconception mm -hmm. that I see all the time where people think uh, that they can't necessarily pursue a career in security if they don't necessarily know exactly how these systems work. Now there's mm. goals you certainly can't do if you don't know, if you don't know how the tech works, mm -hmm. you can't know how to break it. So like you couldn't be an ethical hacker without understanding how the system works, but there's plenty of jobs in security that don't, you don't need that. And so tell me a little bit more about this idea as you see it, that you don't necessarily need to understand the science behind something to actually understand it. Yeah. I mean, I think, honestly, I think that's how a lot of science comes to be too. Like there's accidental discoveries and things like that. Um, I think, you know, in the modern world, you know, we've had the industrial revolution, we've had a lot of time since then, I think you do need to understand enough science to do most things, right? Mm -hmm. And especially what we do. Um, I, I have to draw upon many different fields from biology to chemistry, um, towards nutritional science and things like that. Um, and occasionally computer technology as well, right? Um, but I think that there's there's an essence of experimentation for understanding and an essence of experimentation for engineering purposes. And I think that distinction is something that I've been evolving in my head, um, mostly actually after the starting the company where um, I'd done a lot of work in a more science oriented context previously, and now doing more work in a very, you know, business oriented context. Um, sometimes you get to a point where you've done experiments and you know the right parameters, you know how something works, but you don't necessarily know the mechanism 
um, you have some ideas of what the mechanism could be. You know enough to know that it's, you know, for instance, safe. You know enough, for instance, to know that it's going to continue working. Um, but, you know, you don't understand it all the way down to the atoms necessarily in all cases. Um, and so there's an abstraction layer you can place over it. And no one in the world may actually know what's going on underneath that abstraction layer, you know, as opposed to like the computer technology side where there's probably someone who knows what goes on underneath that abstraction layer, but maybe you don't need to know it. Um, and I think a similar thing can happen where you can have abstraction layers, even in the physical sciences, um, if your goal is more engineering or technology oriented. Um, and maybe no one understands what the low layer is. You still figure it out. I mean, I think that it's the essence of certain fields of science, even to think that way, like biology for a long time progressed without knowing a lot of chemistry. Yeah, that's, that's super fascinating. I mean, it's, it's interesting even hearing you talk about it, right? Your, your title is chief technology officer and so many things that you just described are all these different areas then that are not necessarily software based. And mm -hmm. this idea of this abstraction layer, it's, it almost makes me think about the way that I guess as human beings, we interact with or understand really anything. I mean, think about, mm -hmm. well, let me ask this as a question. I'll, I'll start it as a statement and then you poke some holes. Mm -hmm. in it. But it seems to me like as human beings, pretty much everything that we think we know, we really more know the interpretation of that thing, whether it's like a, well, certainly science we're talking about here or leadership principles, which certainly you and I, uh, you know, deal with mm -hmm. in our respective companies. Um, we understand the way we interact with it, right? Like we understand why a certain, say the way you treat an employee has either a positive or negative impact, but we might not understand mm -hmm. the brain chemistry that results in that. And mm -hmm. so yeah. I agree or disagree with the fact that maybe most things that we think we know, we don't really actually know all the way to its root level. I think so. I, I think, honestly, it's, you know, you mentioned uh, talking about technology. I think my like meta understanding, I guess, of this sort of thing um, is something I actually feel like I developed. I mean, a lot in when I was going to college, I, um, I studied biology, engineering and computer science, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt I never really felt connected to math um, before I actually did the computer science work. And in doing that, I came to a lot of thoughts like, I mean, just like having things explained as abstractions in such a pure sense, um, it got me thinking about the whole world that way, I think. And I definitely applied that outside there. And yeah, I 100% think of things that way. Like, yeah. I don't think we know crap, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think anyone who thinks that they do is lying to you, right? You know, you could know a lot about one little thing or you could know a whole lot about a lot of things and it could be a lot to a human, but it's still not a lot to the universe. Right. We might have to title this episode. We don't know crap. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> maybe it summarizes. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, doesn't that summarize the scientific mindset, right? That because we don't know something, we're constantly maybe trying to understand it better to formulate uh, experiments in order to understand uh, the concepts. And, and you, you certainly talked about this idea of, I think you said, I wrote it down because it was really powerful, the essence of experimentation. And I would imagine mm. that in the field of, you know, how do you create the sort of meat experience without meat? Uh, that probably yeah. is nothing but experimentation. So how, how does one think about the process of experimenting? I mean, like I said, I think it's important to build on the shoulders of giants right? So it, it's important to understand the basis of what you're working with, right? And so for us, that's a lot of uh, chemistry understanding. It's a lot of understanding the biology of things we're working with, especially because, you know, at, at, uh, at Primates, we use the fermentation technology as well as just um, using different ingredients. We actually grow um, some of our own fungi. And so that's a like component that goes into it too. And you need to understand how these things work to be able to experiment them and to be able to interpret the data and the things that come out of it. Um, but I think it's, it's really about interpretation, right? And it's about knowing where to look too. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, we do a lot of experimentation and I think it's about designing those experiments well, making sure you get some good conclusions out of them. And um, 
it, it's also in a pretty limited context, right? I mean, we're a food company, right? And so there's a pretty big limit on what you can do and still have something not, I mean, at one level there's being safe to eat, right? And there's also being provably safe to eat. I think there's a lot of things that are safe to eat, but are not provably safe to eat, but we need to operate in the space of things that are provably safe to eat. Mm -hmm. And so um, you actually have a very good understanding of where those limits are, both of those boundaries, I think. Hmm. So that's an interesting distinction that you're drawing that there's the, this, this level of safe to eat versus provably safe to eat. And when you were talking about experimentation, it got me thinking about um, maybe some of the parallels between our very different worlds, right? That, you know, you're, you're, you make food mm -hmm. and we hack systems. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. so much of what you described sounds like what a security researcher's job is, right? Is to constantly be probing and experimenting and saying, hey, I tried X that didn't, result in what I thought it might. So let's learn from that. And now let's try Y and see what happens. And then let's try Z. And so what I think I heard you say, and tell me if you agree or disagree with this, I heard you say mm -hmm. that, that, that experimentation is iterative and you sort of, yep. you're not only building on the shoulders of giants, like others who've come before you, but you're also building on your own experience. Certainly, you know, and, and, and the understanding of others and our own understanding of things too. Right. Um, you know, I think, you know, the difference is like, instead of probing, you know, other human designed systems, right? We're probing natural systems, like we're probing plants, we're probing animals, we're probing uh, fungi. Um, and we're kind of seeing what we can do with them, right? Um, and, and it actually is very similar, because in the security context, you don't know the design of the system. And I think it's actually very similar to biology because you don't necessarily know the design of nature, right? And it's very complicated. Um, and I think it's, you know, there, there's, there's a different creator and that creator isn't a person, so you can't go ask them. <laughs> right. um, and I think that's why, you know, there's, I mean, the, the amount of knowledge we have at this point um, in 2021 about biology is actually staggering. It's mm -hmm. one of the things I was gonna mention earlier is that the, um, I bet there's, I feel like there's a bit of a Dunning-Kruger effect going on as like a society where like we now know enough to know that we don't know things <laughs> um, in general. It's like, I just imagine going back and I feel that someone living in the uh, 1500s was probably actually more confident that they know about how the world works than we are today. Hmm. So let me paint a scenario for you and tell me what the parallels would be that you see, or, or maybe don't see any, um, about the advancement of food science. I don't know if that would be the right term, but like what you- I think that would be the right term, yes. Paper. Yeah, no, we effectively do work in the space of food science. I think that's the best descriptor. Okay. So uh, in, in the security world, um, one of the things that, uh, not even just security, specifically within ethical hacking, one of the things that we come across all the time is we might be talking to a company and they, they'll say some version of, are you familiar with this? And they'll say like a language or some sort of technical mm. construct, you know, something that is you know, very central to their technology. And they'll say, are you used to, are you familiar with, or you have experience with like this thing? And what's really interesting to us is that um, on pretty much anything we ever work on, there's always some element that we've never seen before. And so oftentimes the answer to that question, because usually they're asking about some very exotic custom, like, you know, specialty thing, right? Usually the answer is no. And, mm -hmm. or, or we don't have a ton of experience on that. And one of the ways that we always try to help people understand why that's actually not a problem is I use this metaphor around cars. And so I'll say like, for example, let's say that we're really good at testing braking systems but we only ever test braking systems for Toyotas. Well, mm -hmm. when the person comes to us and says, well, here's a Tesla, it's a totally different braking system. You've never seen something like this before. Can you test mm -hmm. it? We'd say, well, we've never tested that system before, but I assure you our understanding of the principles of braking systems, we will absolutely know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And that is ultimately what bears out to be true. So do you think that what I just described, that sort of scenario of, in the process of experimenting or, or working in food science, 
when you come across mm-hmm. it you've never experienced before, does that make you dead in the, dead in your tracks, dead in the water? Or is it because you've already sort of established the way to think about certain problems that that expertise helps you solve new problems? I think this is a huge part of how I think about building a team or building teams within our company. Um, because I think in the realm of food science or just food generally, um, a lot of people work, it, it would be as if like 90% of the market was COBOL programming. Like that would be the analogy I would give. Like in the food industry, 90% of the market is like crackers or, you know, just really normal stuff that people, cookies, you know, like that when people work in food science, most jobs, most people are working on really old technologies, right? Because food actually, like the habits of food do not change as quickly, right? Um, Because it definitely results in the impacts and the outcomes. And also, like I was saying, there's a very limited space um, in the sense that, you know, the ingredient set we have, it does change, but it doesn't change that much, right? And so um, us, you know, we, we do limit ourselves to you know, all natural ingredients. That's the only space we play in, right? Like mm-hmm. if I said I could design any molecule I wanted and use that in our product, there'd be a lot more options, but I don't know if anyone would want to eat it. I wouldn't want to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that's the first and foremost thing. It's very important. You know, you're using all natural stuff. I mean, but that does limit your toolbox, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so most of the elements in that toolbox are tools that you can hire people who are very familiar with, right? Um, but we do one really special thing. You know, we, we grow Koji, we grow these film, this fungi, and we use that as the absolute basis and the main ingredient in our products. And that's something that I'm not going to find anyone who has experience doing. And so I think like from a human perspective, there are people who are capable of treating it the way that you're talking about it, where it's like, oh, I've never seen a Tesla before, but I know how to test this. I know how to design for this. Um, but I think in our industry, it can actually be somewhat challenging and of course not possible. We've done it, um, but not everyone comes into things with that mindset exactly. Um, and so we just need to find the people who do. Right. Maybe that's a universal truth, even about all things, right? That the majority of people like pick a discipline, the majority of people probably mm-hmm. think a certain way. I mean, this show is about how do we think that I, I only want people on the show who have sort of bucked trends and, um, and I think what you're saying seems to be universal, right? 90% of the people in any given discipline probably think or operate in a certain way. And it's those 10%, you know, 5% on each side of the bell curve where mm-hmm. uh, real divergent thinking lives. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, there's just divergent thinking. Like there, there's certain people that are more attuned to that, I think, right? And certain people that that's just what they want to do. And there's some people who, you know, maybe aren't your early adopters. They, uh, they aren't the people who push boundaries. They just kind of want to live more of a normal life. They, you know, there's this bit of a self-selection, I think, that occurs of where people end up and things like that. And so, um, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about, you know, what is technology? I think that's actually part of the inertia of like, what is technology? Is that the technology thinkers, I think, gravitate towards where there's technology to be developed, right? And where there's new and exciting things happening. You know, if you're that type of person growing up, what are you going to get into? What are you going to try and do with your life, right? Um, And that influences what you learn. Um, And so I think that's actually, it's one of the things that makes it a little sticky over a time period is that um, any new space of technology that's kind of picking up, it needs to get visibly excited, excited enough for there to be like a good talent pool working on those types of problems. Um, to like progress right yeah that, that's that's really interesting too i mean you think about for example what's happening in cryptocurrency right now which is still mm-hmm. super 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 early um mm-hmm. even though i think the people who are enthusiasts in it feel like hey we're, we've already we're already entering early adopters phase and that's i, I don't know it's probably not exactly true yet but yeah. you look at something like that and you've got this small community relative to you know human population of people that are super passionate about it. And then like mm-hmm. most of the world probably hasn't even thought about what Bitcoin is yet. And mm-hmm. if you compare what's happening with meat alternatives 
to something like that. Um, would you say that we're farther along with meat alternatives um, as compared to something like cryptocurrency or is it still in its infancy? <laughs> it's a tough question, I think. Um, with no data at all. I think from the I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think they're both in their infancy, honestly. If I, if I were to brought it br more broadly speaking to biology as an innovation platform, um, I think that is more in its infancy than like software as an innovation platform. I think that that's picking up now. Like we're starting to see more innovators entering biology as a space um, as opposed to software as a space where software I think is in a mature cycle of like, if you're an innovator type, people want to go into software, right? Um, whereas cryptocurrency is a subset that I think is agreed uh, in its infancy. And then, I mean, certainly, you know, meat alternatives have existed for a very long time, but I think it's only very recently um, that people have really taken that innovation approach to it um, and thought about how can we truly make this great? How can we make this something that truly replaces meat, right? I think in the past, it's been something that um, was really just made for people who had ethical considerations where they weren't going to eat any meat at all, whether there was a product for them or there wasn't, right? Um, but today, you know, we're out here making products for people who eat meat. I eat meat and I eat our products, right? Um, I mean, I think that's actually a very powerful statement. You know, it's, it's um, that's, we're definitely in the infancy stages of that, of making meat alternatives that are so convincing and um, so applicable to the lifestyles of anyone, right? And I think that takes a whole lot more innovation than saying, oh, we're gonna slap some tofu into this, right? Right. Um, it's very different. And that is in its infancy. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. And, and I love the common theme that is woven throughout everything we're talking about today around, you know, innovation and even the idea of innovation itself, based on what I'm hearing you say, innovates and it, it shifts. And mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about software until the way you talked about it as a more mature area of innovation. Cause mm -hmm. to me, you know, living in a software world, it feels like it's nothing but innovation here. And to compare that mm -hmm. to maybe a more emerging field like yours, where innovation is sort of viewed differently, different lens, but has some of the similar, I guess, core tenants. That's really fascinating. So how do you, how do you even consider or think about the right frame for what innovation really even is? Like there's a definition. I guess I mean, in that like, sense, when I'm talking about it, I might be like talking about, I, I'm not sure like, depending on how we define it, if that's like, you know, like the second derivative or the first derivative of the innovation curve. But like when I'm saying software is mature, it's not like there isn't innovation occurring in software. There's yeah. tons. But to me, there's an element of maturity when you look at like the top five most valuable companies in the world and they're pretty much software companies. Right. You know, I, I think that speaks to that. Um, and I'm not saying they aren't doing innovative things, right? But, you know, I think there's... Um, it's like the pace of acceleration of innovation. Like the pace of innovation is quite hard in software, but I don't think it's accelerating as much as say biology's pace of innovation is right now. Hmm. That's kind of like the distinction I'm making in my head. Yeah. The velocity of it. I'm imagining it as like the- Yeah, we talk about velocity of innovation versus yeah. the acceleration of innovation, right? Hmm. I don't think the acceleration of software I don't even know if there is much acceleration in innovation of software. The speed and the velocity of innovation is very high in software, mm -hmm. but I don't know how much acceleration there is today. Wow, that's really fascinating, man. You've given me a lot, a lot to think about here. Um, yeah. So as we, as we uh, come to the conclusion of our time here together and you think about maybe what's coming next, which we all are trying to do, right? We're trying to forecast the future. Um, what is it that you'd want to leave our listeners with in terms of what they should expect for the future of you know, any of the topics we've talked about today, whether that's the future of food science or the future of the way innovation itself will change? What are your thoughts? I mean, I think this is something that um, I have felt since I was very young. Um, I think if we're talking about the acceleration of innovation, I do feel like biology and the adjacent fields, which I think does include food science and the work that we do here, um, is where I think I see the strongest acceleration in the, um, in the pace of innovation. And I think it's a very exciting place um, for people to get into if they're thinking about you know, starting a career somewhere and they want to be an innovator. 
um software is of course a great place too <laughs> um and i think i mean it's just i'm i'm someone you know if i have a moment to plug something here before the end it's not the company um it'd be what i care about in the world right and um why did i start this and i think it's it's about um you know i i've been a a semi-professional skier for a little bit actually and I think that gave me a really big touch to the environment and a, a big connection to there and um, I don't know how many people are aware of it but um, the toll that meat production um, and seafood production places on our environment um, on our oceans on our land on our forests is astronomical I mean a lot of people think that it's a big deal whether they get food from the Southern hemisphere or whether they get food from something 10 miles away. It turns out that has a minuscule impact. The local impact is minuscule compared to how plant-based versus how meat-based your diet is. Mm -hmm. And I think just, you know, as people who like numbers and people who like the facts, I think that's something you know, I, I'm not going to talk too much further until, but you could do your own research there if you're listening and, um, I think it's something very important to be aware of and to think about your personal choices, not to mention how it affects your health, but yeah. I think that's something that matters to me. Wow. That's a, that's a really powerful note to end on that. What I'm hearing you say, I mean, even, uh, even aside from the specifics of what you said, but what I'm hearing you say is you are on a mission and that, mm -hmm. I love that, right? You're, you're of course, you know, running a company, hoping to make money and help people solve their problems and stuff. Of course. But the purpose yeah. is associated with a cause and uh, that's really beautiful. And I'm glad, I'm glad that that's what you wanted to plug. Cause that's uh, I, I resonate with that so strongly. Um, so Josh Nixon, CTO prime roots. Thank you so much for spending some time with us together today. You've given me a lot to think about and our listeners as well. All right. Thanks Ted. Yeah. For everybody else, if you want to learn more about this episode or other episodes or request to appear as a guest, just head over to tedharrington.com backslash podcast, and we'll catch you next time.